Are you thinking, I want to buy another house and rent my current house out? Maybe you're fortunate enough. You can be in the position to be able to do this, where you can acquire a new piece of real estate, another home to move into, while keeping your old one and renting it out. But should you? Don't be a landlord until you can answer these four questions. You may be thinking, you're a real estate agent. Of course, you're going to say to sell. Well, welcome to my channel. You're a first time around here, I can tell. Hey there. Christian Walsh, real estate agent with Wire Associates. We've been helping buyers and sellers and tenants and landlords with the best advice to help navigate these crazy days. And we're here with a big update. We know this is a popular topic where folks are interested in keeping their current home, buying another one, and renting out that old home. We just interviewed Mike Simonson from Altos Research, and we were doing this for our video about why there are no homes for sale. He discussed just how many mom and pop landlords there are out there, where they bought another home, kept the old one because they could afford to cover the mortgage because interest rates have been so historically low. And what this has done is this has taken serious inventory out of the market. I'll let him explain here. The reason that inventory is so low, or one of the reasons, is over the last decade, mortgage rates have been generally falling. They've been falling for longer than that, but they've been yeah. really low over the last decade, 4% or lower. What's happened is because... The cost of money is so low. It's a really good time to do things like I go to buy my second home. If my mortgage is at 3%, I can just buy another home and not sell the first one. Now I have two and I have an investment property. Americans have taken like 8 million homes out of the resale market and turned them into rental properties in the last decade. And each year, more and more of those happens. And, and most of those are individuals with one to four units. They're not, they're not big hedge funds. So if you're ready to figure out whether you should be a landlord by answering these four questions, hit that like button and let's get started. Question number one is, do you have a burning desire to be a landlord? It's time to do some soul searching. Some folks are very interested in the idea of being a landlord. And my channel is the right place for you because we're giving you the latest updates for landlords and tenants. You need to make sure you have the desire to deal with what can be headaches in owning rental property. Don't get me wrong, it can be very lucrative for a landlord in the long run, but it is going to take a lot of work. How do you know if you have a burning desire? If you're interested in researching the topic, you're watching videos out there, you wanna learn everything you can about being a landlord, then I'd say, you know what? Maybe you have that burning desire. Maybe you were raised in a family where there were landlords, so you know what it takes and you can do a good job. I'd say, yeah, then I think you should take a shot at it. Even if you hire a property manager, being a landlord means staying up on the latest laws and regulations. It means driving by your property. It means paying for maintenance. It means taking care of the tenant and taking care of the property. And as far as it goes, finding a property manager it can be very difficult to find a good one. You have to have a certain knowledge about being a landlord in order to vet a property manager and make sure that they're going to do a good job for you because it is absolutely impossible for a property to take care of itself. Another important question, and we could literally release dozens of videos on this and we're working our way on doing that is, is your property a good rental property? Just because you own the property doesn't mean that this automatically makes it an amazing rental property. A prime example are condos or townhomes with HOA dues. The HOA dues eat into profitability and tend to increase over time. So condos and townhomes do not, in general, pencil very well as an investment property. You're better off with a detached single family home, but it's still, even a detached Detached single family home may not be the best rental property. There's a lot of different factors that go into determining whether a property is good as a rental property and you'll be able to maximize your dollar, maximize your return. You have to look at the local rental area to see how solid it is from an economic standpoint. There's things like rent control that could be passed in the area. Other important things are the number of bedrooms and bathrooms, where it's located, how close it is to schools, how close it is to shops shopping and freeways. Maybe it's too close to freeways and shopping. So that's going to affect rent. There's a lot of factors in evaluating a property. Another question you'll ask is how much can I rent my property for? And this is a very important question to answer. That's the pro forma rent.
rent. You have to figure out what is a good market rent for the property. Of course, we help our clients do that, and there are some online tools out there, but that's an important factor. You need to ultimately figure out what your return is gonna be. Once you figure out how much your house can rent for, you have to subtract your expenses, and by expenses, I mean, insurance, property taxes, any utilities, HOA dues. If you're going to have a property manager, there should be a fund for maintenance. So you should be saving money for that. There should be a vacancy factor so you can cover when it's potentially empty. And then if you have a mortgage, you can add that in because we're calculating cash flow. So you add all the expenses against that, subtract that from your monthly rent, and then you determine what cash flow is left over. You might have to be realistic because what a lot of people don't factor in, for example, is maintenance. If something big breaks in the property, it can completely eliminate any cash flow. Then look at your cash flow, look at that number after you pay your debt service and think long and hard if that's a good return for you. Another thing to consider is more than just cash flow. Maybe another property is going to offer you a little less cash flow, but a better chance of appreciation. This is what we tend to find in coastal cities. These are all factors that you need to consider to determine whether your house is the best possible investment. If you really truly wanna invest in real estate and maximize your return on your investment in real estate, you may find that your house may not be the best property. It may be worth selling your house and buying another property that's giving you a better return on investment. Question number three is, could you do something better with your money? So if you sold that property and put it into something else, could you generate a higher return? So theoretically, you've roughly calculated your cash flow and you've roughly calculated your rate of return. What do you know? What are you an expert in? Maybe you're an expert in some field where you could generate higher returns if you put that money into something else. So just because real estate does create a massive amount of wealth doesn't mean that that's the only way to create wealth. If you can get a better return in something else, Real estate may only give you a four to five percent return. If you can get a six, seven, or eight percent return in something else that you know, then maybe it's worth selling. And there's one more concept that we didn't get into. We'll release additional content on that, and that is return on equity. What you need to know as an investor is not necessarily what you paid for the property when calculating a return, it's what it's worth. So you may be getting a teeny tiny rent compared to what it's worth, whereas if you sold that and took those funds to another property, you may be able to get a whole lot more monthly rent. So that's a quick overview on return on equity. I hope you didn't fall asleep on me. There's a concept, the highest and best use for real estate. How about the highest and best use for your money? Put your money to work where you know it'll do the best. One more important point to make under this is that there will be changes in income taxes once you convert a property from a primary residence to a rental. We can't give tax or legal advice, but you know you can come here for the most honest real estate advice. But what happens is, in order to take advantage of the primary residence section 121 capital gains exclusion, that's 250,000 if you're single, 500,000 if you're married, you have to occupy a home as your primary residence for two out of five years. And we've done another video on it. We'll link to it above so you can watch Watch that. The minute you've lost that two out of five, so if you rent the property out for three years or more, you've, it's gone. You've lost section 121 to avoid capital gains tax. Now what you need to do for the property is you have to do a 1031 exchange. And we've done content on this, and it's a great tool to avoid gain, but you're, you've lost that potentially $500,000 in free money you could have walked away with. You can't pull that out with a 1031 exchange. So that's an important concept. Leave any questions below. That's a very quick overview on that. I'm gonna have more content coming on that. In addition to that, you're gonna to have to treat the property as a rental property, take depreciation, things like that. And another thing, and this is a hot little tip, is your insurance for the property. Make sure you double check and let your insurer know that you've changed the use from personal to business. One more question is, how long can you last without rent? How long can you last without being paid 
in your rental property? And this is a very important question. This is your vacancy factor. So I'm not talking about what we've just come through in the pandemic. Nobody could have planned for that for 15 or 18 months of not receiving rent. That is very extreme and hopefully we don't have that happen in our lifetime again. But you need to do the math and see how long you can last without having rent come in. For example, if you have a problem tenant who stops paying rent and you have to go through an eviction, it can take 60, 90, 120 days to get them out and then get someone else in there. Can you realistically weather that? While the cash flow you're getting of maybe a couple grand a year sounds like good money, the minute you go through something like this, it erases all those gains. So that's very important. And again, this kind of ties back into being passionate and you have a burning desire to be a landlord. That's part of the risk of being a landlord that you need to go in with eyes wide open. We're not trying to scare you from being a landlord. We work with tons of landlords as real estate agents, but we just want you to go in knowing what you're getting into. If you're interested in discussing more about becoming a landlord, feel free to reach out to us. Our contact information is below and we'll run through your specific situation to help you decide if it makes sense to be a landlord. Leave your questions below. Let us know any horror stories you have or tell me I'm wrong. Tell me it's easier than I make it sound. I want to know what you have to say. We'd love for you to join the other 2,000 subscribers to our free weekly email newsletter. We cover topics like this for landlords and tenants, plus a whole lot more for buyers and sellers. Don't miss this next video for more you need to know about real estate. Thanks for tuning in. This has been Christian Walsh, real estate agent with Wire Associates, and we appreciate you.